Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. Uh, sorry the video is a bit late today. Uh, I'm feeling emotionally uh, exhausted after watching all the sport this afternoon, uh, especially sport from the uh, from Augusta. Um, I'm a big golf fan, uh, quite a keen golf player. So I am, uh, yeah, uh, incredible. Um, so anyway, what are we doing today? Well, I thought what we'd do is take a look at a puzzle that Ben has tweeted to us. Um, he says that this is an extremely interesting puzzle because of its end game. And he says that this has an example of uniqueness and using the uniqueness constraint that is extremely unusual. So I thought this might make a nice puzzle to take a look at. Um, and that's what I'm going to do. So how do we do this? We've got a 7 and a 7. Let's put a 7 to this square. Uh, and a 7 and a 7 and this 7. So there's a 7 in that square too, which means there's a 7 here. And a 7 here, in fact, because we have a 7 and a 7 and this 7. So in fact, we just complete the 7s immediately um, without having to do much thinking at all which is fine by me today. So now what next? Um, oh, hang on, I've just seen I can put four in. Four, four, this has got to be a four. Which means this is a four. Four in one of these two squares. As usual, I'll pen pencil mark in three by three blocks if a number can only go in two positions. So quick scan along the middle row. We need a two and an eight in the extremities but we have no twos and eights in the columns or the boxes so we can't fill that in just yet and in this these two squares we need three and six well there is a three there look so let's put that in three and six therefore this is a three because of the three there and this three um, and it feels like we're off to a reasonable start now Ah, ones. One, one. This has got to be a one. And therefore, we get to place two ones into those two squares. Two ones into these two squares. Oh, and this one means there's a one in the middle look at the top. So let's put that in as well. Um, five and six. I'm sorry. I, I mean, one of the comments that Mark and I get a lot is, "Oh, you missed. You know, you missed something during your solve." Well, I mean. Both of us would love not to miss things, believe me. Um, but it is really difficult when you're live solving. I mean, look at this, for example. I've just missed that this number could be filled in. And I, I think, I really believe that if I was solving on paper, I would just immediately jump to that. But for some reason, the way my eyes work and the way when you're solving on computer works, it's just it just doesn't happen as naturally. Um, so I ask your forbearance when we make mistakes. Um, which we do all the time, um, and just hopefully there's enough, you know, good content and sharp logic that keeps the videos interesting. Um, now, what next? Four, four here, so we can pencil mark to fours into those two positions. Three, ah, threes, three, three, and this three here, so I can place a three at the top. And three over at pencil marks and threes down there. Uh, nor sevens because they're not interesting. Twos can go into one of those two squares. Um, oh, I thought I could do something with nines, but I'm not sure I can. Threes, sixes, uh, ones into one of these two positions. see how to do anything with eights there. Okay, let's let's reset now. Ah, eights here though. Eights in one of these two squares, this eight here and that eight there, so I can place an eight into this position. Ah that's that's great because that gives me a one eight pair in these two squares. Which means these two squares must be two and nine now and there is a nine here so I finally oh not a six a nine the two that means this is an eight over here let's fill in the nine pencil marks 
twos into one of these two positions, fives into one of these two positions, and this six here means we get to pencil mark those in. So this is a five or a six in this square, but can't remember with Snyder notations we call it where we're highlighting uh, just numbers that can go into two positions in each three by three block. I shouldn't really pencil mark the five and six here. Hopefully, hopefully I won't need to. I'm just going to check this block here. We've got a three, you see, so I can pencil mark the threes into those two squares and. Ah. Okay, so what can we do from here? Ah, right, okay. Now I was being a bit dense, especially as I've been told to look for uniqueness. But this is a very rare beast indeed. Look at this, I don't know that I've ever seen this before. I want you to focus on these middle three rows of the grid. Stare at them, think about them, see if you can see why there is an immediate number that we can enter in these three rows. It's not that easy to spot. I'll, I'll um, in fact, in order to show it a bit more clearly, let me pencil mark fully. There you go. So I pencil mark them fully now. So take a stare at them and see if you can see something rather interesting. And I'll talk about it now. The critical thing to realize is let's imagine in when we looked at the solution to this puzzle, let's imagine there was a nine in this square. What would the implication of that be? So I'll actually put it in. Let's imagine there's a nine here. And now, now look at the central three rows. And the problem is that this Sudoku is now broken. It is, it has two solutions, which is really quite incredible. Um, jeepers creepers. This, I mean, this you don't see this very often. I have to say, as I say, I've never seen it before, where we have four different pairs interacting to give us a uniqueness problem. Now, why is this a uniqueness problem? Well, um, it's one of these challenging things to explain, actually. But one way to think about it is that these four pairs actually exist independently of the rest of the puzzle. And I say that because we can change the values in any one of these cells, and it will only affect these eight cells. It will have no effect at all on the rest of the puzzle. And that should immediately be ringing alarm bells for people, because let's, for example, let's imagine this was a two. Now, if this is a two, that's going to give us an eight here, a one here, and a five in the top in, in row four. And it's going to give us a two here, a five here, a one here, and an eight here in row six. But the problem with that arrangement is there is nothing in the puzzle that distinguishes it from if we just selected a five in this square. If there was a five in this square, all that happens is that every single cell I've just mentioned switches polarity, it switches to its alternative. Um, but there's no way of telling which solution the setter wanted us to record. Um, and that's because there are two solutions. Now, with good Sudoku puzzles, we can therefore use the fact that we know there's one solution to our advantage, we can use that to say, actually, it's not possible that this square is ever a nine, because if it's a nine, the resultant puzzle would have two solutions. So I can remove the nine from this square. And once I've done that, look, oh, I can place a nine in this square. Now, this is incredibly rare. As I say, most examples of this pattern would instead, let me try and show you, it would be more like and remove the ones. Let's ignore the contents of the rest of the boxes. Let's just look at these four squares. It's more like this. This happens all the time, where you have a pair of numbers that is mirrored by another pair of numbers in an equivalent row. Now, if you see this possibility arising, you can rule it out. This can't happen. If these, if this was really the situation, we could put a two here, a two here, five, five, or switch them round. And again, you get two solutions. So 
Um, this is very common where there are, I suppose, two pairs. Three pairs you see, you know, once in a blue moon. Four pairs, no, you don't see that. I mean, this is this is really quite something. Um, so, thank you, thank you, Ben, for showing this to us. Now, as I say, this means this square here has to be a nine. Now, let's see if that actually is the critical step to making progress with the puzzle. So you see nine here, nine here, and this nine. Now it gives us a nine into this square, um, which allows us to pencil mark nines at the top. Um, now this square must be two or six. Ah, I see, I see, right, okay. But now let's have a look at column two. Where can we place a 6 in column 2? We can place it here and here. Now this is rather nice as well. I mean, in fact, <laughs> you could use uniqueness here again to, to deduce there could not be a 5 in either of these two squares. But, um, but let's not do that because we don't need to. The fact that the 6 in this 3x3 block is locked into row 1 and row 3 and the 6 in this 3x3 three three block is locked into row 1 and row 3 is enough because now we know, we know we've got to put a 6 somewhere in row 2 of the grid where are we going to do that? well it can't go in this 3x3 three three block because we know the 6 is in one of these two positions obviously it can't go in this 3x3 three three block because we have already have a 7, 1 and a 3 along row 2 so we know that the 6 is either here or here well look there is a 6 there, so it's definitely not in this position, and in fact it must be there. And I'm hoping, obviously that allows us to unwind the 5 down here, which gives us a 2 and a 6 into those two squares. Now this, I'm hoping, will be enough. So there's now a 2 here, which unwinds the 2 and the 5. Now unwinding the 2 and the 5 is important, because that was the one way of disambiguating these central three rows, so we can now do that. Um, five and the eight now unwind. Eight, eight. So this is now an eight, which means this must be a six, which unwinds the six and the five. And the only thing we have to be careful about now is not to go too quickly, because I think I think we've done it. I mean, the puzzle I think is solved. So. This must be a 6, this must be a 3. That means this is a 3, this is a 4, and this is a 4. Let's remove the 3 from this square. Um, now we know there's a 5 along here somewhere. We have a 5 there, look. So, oops, let's put the 5s in. Now where do we put 5 along row 3? Well, it can't go in this square, so it's going to have to go here, which means this unwinds is 5, 1, 9. This is now 1. This should be a 5, which looks like it's working. We need to put 2 and 9 in. You can see that again. This is all working nicely. And there we go. So a very, very interesting puzzle. Um, most of it was straightforward. But we had the opportunity in these central three rows to spot something really unusual. Now, what I want to do now... I'm going to type this into a solver. I'm going to type this puzzle into a solver. And let's see whether the solver understands the logic we just used. And my suspicion is it won't, because most solvers will spot uniqueness when it's one of these patterns of four that I, I use as an example. I think I use these four squares here. Most solvers know, understand that, and they, they understand how to look for that. But well, I don't think any of the normal solvers will look at four pairs, which is what we had here. And therefore, I think solvers will have to use more exotic logic to get to a solution. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because if you know what to look for, if you look for the pattern we've just seen in this puzzle, you're being more efficient than a computer solver. And that's always a good thing. So one second and I'll type it into a solver and come back to you. Okay, now you're going to have to bear with me now because I'm not very used to using this. This is um, this is a Sudoku solver called SudokuWiki.org, and I've typed it in here, so I think it's now going to show me how to do it. Um, let's have a look. Oh, 
come on, I don't know why it's got a six there. I think I already got that six. Okay, so it's found a whole load of pairs by the looks of it, which I think we'd found. Yeah, so okay, so now it's honed in. This is the position where we were in, where we, we, we identified we could not have a nine in this square. So let's see what this thing says. How do I do this? Okay, so here, um, this looks like, like some sort of X-wing it's found. So it's found an X-wing on sixes. Um, now, the X-wing on sixes, you can see, has not eliminated any cell down to just a single candidate. So it's going to need more than an X-wing. So we did not need an X-wing. We just needed uniqueness. So let's see where it goes from here. Uh, okay, so now it's found a is that, is that a triple? It's found a triple in column three, which looks like that's what solved the puzzle. Okay. Oh, no, something else. What's this? Okay, so that's a Y wing. There's a bent triple going around the corner there on the numbers five, six, and nine, which again, that's not eliminated. It's eliminated this five, which is nice. Another Y wing. Okay, and that. Okay, this is fascinating, isn't it? So, and there we go. Right, so I was hoping this would happen. So in order to mimic the effect we got from our uniqueness constraint, the computer needed an X-wing and two Y-wings. So I asked you this, which would you rather learn about? Um, clearly the uniqueness argument there is extremely powerful. It gets to the solution very efficiently and that, for that reason, I thank Ben for sending this in. Very, very interesting puzzle. Uh, if you enjoy the content, please subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. Um, on Patreon now, for $2 a month, uh, you get a Cracking the Cryptic um, Sudoku puzzle. And this one is between one and nine Sudoku. It's it's live at the moment, and it's pretty good. It's a pretty good, stiff challenge. Um, and there's gonna be a video uh, up on how to solve that in the next few days as well. Um, and if you want the video, it's just an extra dollar a month. So please support us if you can. We'd really appreciate that. Um, if not, no worries. Um, maybe subscribe, maybe give us a thumbs up, maybe give us a positive comment. It, it's all uh, grist to this mill. So thanks for watching. Back soon with another edition of Kraken the Cryptic.